Hello students and welcome to another College Prep World History video. This is Mr. Willis on behalf of Mr. Gordon, Ms. Pansini, and Ms. Zatwood. We're going to be covering today the differences between communism and socialism and capitalism in our video. So let's jump right in. Our first uh, slide here that we have here is of Karl Marx who is uh, the father of Marxist socialism and we're going to be talking a little bit about him and his views on uh, his anti-capitalistic views that we're going to be uh, seeing the differences the main differences between capitalism and socialism and how this is a really hard concept for most people to understand especially younger people to understand uh, mainly because it can get confusing some of those concepts can get confusing however uh, hopefully once we've gone through these you guys will it'll be a lot easier for you guys to understand all right, so let's jump right into this uh, second slide that we have right here, which is our talk on uh, capitalism. And so uh, basically, uh, so you guys understand the system here in the United States of America is a capitalist system. And mainly, you know, the, the basic definition of capitalism is making money. Uh, you, you, one of your goals in, in your life is to make as much money as possible. I think everybody would probably want to have as much money as they possibly can. However, it's not always possible for every single person to do to make tons and tons of money uh, here in a uh, capitalist system like here in the United States we tend to see a fewer amount of people making tons of money because of either opportunity, ingenuity, uh, meaning they come up with a really brilliant idea that makes them tons of money. Uh, somebody like a, a person like Jeff Bezos from Amazon who came up with the concept of, uh, of Amazon and being able to buy anything from basically his store and have it delivered uh, in two days is a concept that makes him billions of dollars every year. And so he is a big benefactor of the capitalist system we have here in the United States. So he is just one example of a capitalist uh, ideal that we have here in America. But basically this idea comes from Scotland, from Adam Smith, a Scottish uh, philosopher who basically said that uh, the government should stay out of the money-making process as much as possible and allow for people to privately own a business, any business that they wish to, they can own and uh, make money or lose money. It's totally up to them and the government should stay out of it. And so that's what we call a, a laissez-faire capitalist system. Laissez-faire is the term right there in the middle of the, uh, the slide. So you definitely need to know what capitalism is. Capitalism, write that down. Capitalism is a free economy, meaning you can sell whatever you want to sell and you can own a business if you have the money to do so and the government should have very little interference in uh, the making of money or the losing of money in some some cases depending on the type of business you run so there are very few examples um, of when the government has interfered in a capitalist system and I'll get into that in just a moment but make sure that you write down capitalism basically it means a free economy and you can privately own your own businesses nothing really is owned by the public in terms of a business so the government stays completely out of it or as close to completely out of it as possible now uh, a little bit over a decade ago uh, probably about closer to 15 years ago now there was an example of when the government interfered in a business uh, decision and we see this sometimes especially like today when it's come to like the merger of bi uh, businesses for example we recently had the merger of t-mobile cell phones with sprint and they were able to get the blessing of the government to merge into one company and why do they have to ask for permission to do that in some cases and it's mainly because the government does not want a business to monopolize they don't want to monopolize you guys have heard of the game monopoly before they're basically saying they don't want a company to be able to 
have all the business in one sector of the economy. So you don't want to have uh, Microsoft have a monopoly on all the computers. You don't want to have Arco have a monopoly on all the gasoline selling. And this is because it drives the prices of goods up. The competi competition between businesses is good. You want to have competition because it keeps prices down. And so therefore, that helps us, that helps us, the consumer, uh, be able to afford certain things when you have competition among different businesses. Now, like I was saying a little bit earlier, over a decade ago, Microsoft got sued by the federal government and the federal government won the suit and uh, fined them, I believe it was a uh, billion dollars or $2 billion or something like that in that ballpark. The number is not really that important, but they they won a suit against Microsoft because Microsoft uh, they claim Microsoft held a monopoly on all the operating systems for computers, and so therefore you had to buy you know Windows XP or Windows 10 or whatever in order to operate a computer, and so uh, the government won that. That would be one instance where the government interferes in business. Another instance where government interferes in the way of business would be uh, with interest rates. Interest rates for loans, for example, like when you want to buy a car and you don't have the money to pay cash, the government is the one, the, uh, the Fed is the one who sets the interest rates for what your uh, loan will be. Now, it really it really depends on the house like you purchase for for homes that's really where the interest rate is affected by the fed uh it, but it also is affected by your credit rating meaning how much uh how much can we depend on you in order to pay back the loan and that's only built upon you being able to build your credit over a long period of time so here's mr willis's free uh economic lesson for the day uh, really important that you build up a good credit score early on in your life. How do you do that? You borrow money. Usually you can borrow uh, smaller sums of money and pay it back uh, and don't default on your credit card. Don't default on a loan that you get from the bank because that's how you lower your credit score. In order to buy a house on credit, in order to buy a car on credit, you have to be able to have a good relationship with the bank or the lender who's lending you money. So therefore, it's really important that you, when you borrow money from a bank, uh, that you build your credit over time. And the only way to do that is to be a responsible uh, person paying back your loans to the banks. And so, you know, when you become 18, you can borrow money from the bank. Make sure that you're very responsible. You don't sign up for a credit card that has like 25% interest because every dollar you owe 25 cents if you don't pay it back after one month. And so, therefore, we want to make sure that we're building a good relationship uh, economically, financially with a creditor so that way your credit score will go up. Now, the second piece of, uh, that you need to write down here on this slide is socialism. Socialism is basically the opposite of capitalism. Socialism is the idea that all the factors of production are owned by the public equally, meaning labor and wealth. Uh, we do have some characteristics of socialism here in the United States. Not very many, but some are. I'll give you one example. Uh, when you go to class, education is a socialist a system because the labor and wealth is run by the public, meaning the government is the one who controls it. And so therefore it is a socialist system because they're the ones that are determining uh, in conjunction with uh, you know teachers and, and school districts uh, what is being taught in the, in the classroom and uh, how much a teacher should be paid, so on and so forth, and how much money goes into the system. So the, all those factors are controlled by the public equally. Now this would be, uh, this tends to be an anti-capitalistic ideal. You don't want the government to control factors of business or production because then they really are the ones who are determining who gets paid, what they get paid, 
and uh, who gets the business. So we really don't want that in a capitalist system. So to further along what we were talking about with Karl Marx, um, Karl Marx, ironically, his father owned a textile plant, so his father was a capitalist, but Marx became what we call a Marxist socialist. He writes the Communist Manifesto, and in the manifesto he claims that wealthy owners and poor workers are enemies. This would be a, uh, the opposite of capitalism because in a capitalist system, the poor workers need the wealthy owners to pay their wages. So there's a symbiot what we call a symbiotic relationship. They depend on each other. Whereas in a socialist system or a communist system, uh, there's conflict between the wealthy owners and the poor workers. So therefore, uh, Karl Marx is saying that the workers will, because they're a larger group, they will work to overthrow the owners and create what we call a classless society. Classless society means there are no poor, there are no rich, everybody is equal. And so this is where the term socialism spills into communism because socialism means basically everybody owns everything. So that's publicly owned. And therefore, the who is the one that controls that system? It's the government, right? The government runs a communist system. So Marx says that capitalism will die out, communism will take over, the government will control all factors of production, and the, really they claim the people are the ones who control the factors, when in reality, we know this never to be true in society. There's always a few who usually control most of the influence, right? Even in America, the government controls a lot of the influence of what's going on here in America. And that the government is the one who enforces the rules. So in a communist country, okay, for example, before, the, before Russia became the uh, democratic system, so-called democratic system it is today, because some would argue it's still not democratic, um, it was the Soviet Union and uh, people like Joseph Stalin, who we'll study later on in our class uh, in the second semester, he controlled all the factors of production. Um, he, would, he would have a say in everything. So it's very much like uh, when we covered monarchies, where th the monarch would be in control of everything. This is essentially uh, what we're getting to when we come to a communist regime, where we talk about uh, one person or a small group of people are controlling all the factors. A production. So from this slide, you want to, you definitely want to write down uh, uh, Marxism, social, Marxist socialism, and communism are when uh, wealthy owners and poor workers are enemies, and uh, the government will have complete control of the factors of production, um, and they claim that the people control it, but the government is the one who enforces it. So that's what we need to write down from this slide. Now, as a result of this conflict, what we have are differing viewpoints. We've already talked about capitalism versus communism and socialism, and hopefully you guys understand that a little bit better. I do an activity in my class, and we'll do a, we're going to have a, a bullet points here where we're going to break down the two. But I do an activity in my class where I say, you know, my class owns all of the apples that the world has. What do we do with the apples? Do we sell them all? That would be capitalism. Uh, do we pass them out evenly to everybody and everybody gets the uh, uh, even share? Uh, that would be socialism, right? Or does the government decide, me, Mr. Willis, does he decide what we're going to do with it, essentially? And that would be communism. So that's the type of system, or hopefully that better under you can better understand how that kind of operates. Now, other results from the Industrial Revolution are there are massive labor reforms. In, in a previous uh, PowerPoint, I talked to you guys about how in Manchester there were all these terrible, terrible conditions that existed. Well, because of those terrible conditions, there's going to be changes that occur. And those changes are in the formation of unions or guilds, workers associations that fight for the rights of workers. So you need to write down unions if you didn't do that in the previous PowerPoint. And basically, unions fight for the rights of workers, okay? And if workers are not happy, they can go on strike. 
Um, we're hearing that uh, recently here because of COVID in uh, Los Alamitos uh, Unified School District. They're think the teachers are thinking about going on strike because they feel like they are not being protected uh, d during this pandemic. So it's when the workers decide to go off of uh, go out of work and not work because they're unhappy with the conditions or the situation that they're working in. And usually what that does is it coerces the owners or it coerces the leadership in, into negotiating or working with uh, the workers. Now, um, you can also have the opposite where the workers lock out are locked out by the owners or the leadership. All right. And that's called a lockout. Um, and that's when the owners want to get the workers to come back to the table and negotiate with them. So it works both ways. What this also does is it leads to a rise in paid labor. And because of a rise in paid labor in the 19th century, we begin to see civilized or European countries begin to abolish slavery or the slave trade. First, it's the slave trade, especially in uh, Britain in 1807. The slave trade is abolished and later on slavery will be abolished. Um, we'll see that uh, in America during the, uh, the Civil War where uh, slavery will be abolished mainly because there had to be a conflict fought between the North and the South to abolish the system of slavery. And you'll learn a little bit more about that in U.S. history next year. But we also see women try, just like we did in, during the Enlightenment, we see women try to take advantage of the situation here where they have zero or very little rights. They try to intercede on their own behalf and try to win rights for themselves. And in a small measure, they do. Uh, during the 19th century, women are allowed to work and get paid, but they still are not paid on equal measure. They're paid to about a third of the amount that men are paid. So what we see from this slide is we see uh, labor reforms. We see changes occurring because of the Industrial Revolution, the formation of unions fighting for the rights of workers. And we see the end of slave trade because paid labor increases, meaning I'm going to get paid for my work rather than uh, being owned. And so slavery really begins to diminish over the course of the 19th century, ultimately leading to the end of the slave trade in 1888 in Brazil. And uh, we see women begin to get small measures of rights in terms of labor where they're being paid a third of what men would paid, be paid. Now the next slide, um, what we see here is uh, really important. We see the uh, breakdown of communism versus capitalism. What is the difference between the two? Really important that we see the difference between the two. So in a communist country, you would have no private property. You can imagine living in a country where you could not own your own house. That is the opposite of what the American dream would be. People are not allowed to purchase their own house. Everything is owned by the public. And when they say the public, they really mean the government because the government chooses who gets what, right? It's not true equality. In a communist country, the government chooses what is equally distributed. So imagine if the government said, I'm going to take 50% of everything and then the remaining 50% goes to equally to everybody else. That's not truly true equality. And so this is what we're seeing in communist regimes. Goods and services shared equally, okay, they call that socialism. Um, that doesn't always tend to be the same because you know not everybody needs everything equally. All right? Not everybody's going to need uh, Medicare equally. Not everyone's going to need uh, 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 Social Security equally. It's really for the benefit of a few and you're sacrificing for the benefit of a few. And then you have in a communist regime, you have what we call two different social classes here. You need to know both terms. The bourgeoisie is a term to describe the middle class. All right. And then you have the proletariat in a communist. This term was really adopted by Marx. The proletariat are workers. So you have the bourgeoisie who tend to be factory owner, factory owners and workers, middle class citizens versus the proletariat, the bourgeoisie, the, the, uh, or the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat, proletariat or workers. 
So ultimately, Marx would say that workers would win out against the bourgeoisie. Whereas in a, a capitalist regime, or a capitalist, not a regime, but a capitalist society or system, you have private property. We all can own, this is America. Uh, just like in America, you're able to own private property. You make your own wealth. So you, you can sell, try to sell sand to the beach, but that doesn't mean you're going to be successful, right? It's up to you what you want to sell, and the government cannot interfere in what you're selling unless they think it's a monopoly. Uh, goods and services are up to the individuals what you want to sell. You're, it's up to you whether you make a profit or not, um, whether you're a bad or a good business person. And there's uh, laissez-faire, which means there's no government regulation, which we know here in America that's not exactly true. So we don't really have a laissez-faire capitalist system. We, we have a capitalist system, but the government does interfere in some cases. And then because of capitalism, this is going to lead to different social classes. The, the, you're going to have rich people who are going to make tons of money. You're going to have uh, poor classes of people who are the workers, the backbone of, of the, uh, the society. And in some cases, you'll have middle class. Um, but what we're seeing lately is there's the diminishment of the middle class in favor of more poor or uh, more rich. So a small amount of rich, a lot, a lot of poor uh, between the two. All right, and then finally, um, what we're going to see here, especially in Europe, because that's what we're focusing on, uh, we're going to see the abolition of slavery in Great Britain in 1825. All right, women trying to get equal pay, as I mentioned to you guys, in 1848. Unsuccessful in the United States until the passing of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Uh, women gained the right to vote. All right, and so they're seen as uh, equal in the eyes of as a citizen. So they're able to vote for uh, propositions and amendments to the Constitution. Uh, they're able to vote for president, for other senators and representatives. So it's not until the 20th century. It really has been 100 years uh, this year. It's only been 100 years since women have really had an impact as a citizen here in the United States. So uh, it really hasn't been that long. And then finally here, uh, public education system. This is a final consequence of the Industrial Revolution, is that uh, children are put into a public educational system. It's mandatory that you attend school. Um, this began in 1850, and it was mainly because during the Industrial Revolution, children were working in the factories. And when you're working in the factories and you're suffering injuries and, and, and you're being hurt, they don't, that's not the best place for you. So they, they determined, the government determined that we need to set up some sort of educational system in order to provide opportunities, better opportunities for children beyond the confines of work. You'll always be able to work once you're out of school, but you need to kind of learn the basics while you're in school. All right, so this is my presentation on communism versus capitalism um, and the uh, results of the Industrial Revolution. So... Uh, on behalf of the World History team, I'm Mr. Willis, uh, hoping you guys are doing well in class and we're, we're winding down here the first semester of learning. If you guys have any questions, reach out to your teachers and have a wonderful day.